I'm Tom Coughlin. And I'm Jim Handy. And we're here to talk to you about inefficient data movement, sometimes referred to as the memory wall. This term was coined by process designers to express the challenges they face when a processor's performance is limited by its ability to read and write memory. It's a, prob it's a problem that also confronts storage systems. The data can't be read fast enough or can't be stored fast enough to allow the system to operate at its peak performance. A lot is being done to solve these issues, and we will touch upon a number of these new approaches. So let's get started. We have a big agenda to go through in a brief time, and so we'll be moving pretty quickly. We'll leave some time at the end for questions in case we moved a little bit too fast. In a nutshell, we'll be talking about the issue of inefficient data movement and of a number of approaches being used to solve that problem from bringing persistence to the memory hierarchy through moving compute into memory and storage devices, to abandoning the von Neumann computer architecture altogether, and we'll end by showing how emerging memory technologies help in these efforts. Let's provide some simple perspectives about the issue of data movement, often referred to as the memory wall. This gives a rough idea of where computing uh, was some years back. The processor, network, and storage were on relatively similar uh, footing from a, a, a performance standpoint. Over time, compute and storage increased in performance and capacity, but the network improved at a far slower rate. Data transfer has become a bottleneck. The next slide shows why that's important. This is a typical data processing system with a processor talking to storage through some communications channel most likely the network. How does the data move in this system? First, the processor requests data. This is quick and simple. Data is then sent to the processor. The processor processes the data, and then data is moved back into storage. Moving the data from storage to the processor and back again, numbers two and four in this sequence, consumes a lot of time and energy. How can data movement be accelerated? One way, is to bring storage or persistence closer to the processor. Let's see how this has been evolving over time and how it is likely to continue to evolve in the future. This slide shows the memory storage hierarchy, running from cheap and slow tape, through hardness drives and SSDs, through dynamic random access me main memory, to the various levels of cache memory, L1, L2, and L3. Cost is on the horizontal axis and bandwidth is on the vertical axis. In 2020, in 2000 rather, all there was in these systems was magnetic storage, tape and hard disk drives, and volatile, and volatile storage, volatile memory rather. In 2008, SSDs were added to the mix, and they did very well by making persistence a thousand times faster. They were much newer, nearer to the processor's speed than hard disk drives, and were therefore very well accepted. In 2015, Intel and Micron announced 3D crosspoint memory now called Optane Persistent Memory by Intel. This made persistence about 100 times faster than SSDs, bringing it very near to DRAM speeds. Soon, processor chips will start to include persistent memory for reasons that are explained in our emerging memory report. There's a hot link to the report in the lower right corner of this slide. This persistent memory in the form of MRAM or resistive RAM will first replace the slower cache layers and as it gains maturity, will also displace the faster cache layers. SNEA has to start thinking about how to manage this persistence. Soon after 2025, we should start seeing processors begin to use persistent memory in not only their caches, but in their register sets as well. This may bring all kinds of new ways to harness persistent memory in order to accelerate computing. A good bit of attention has been put on improving the interface or network as well. Let's see what's been done with memory and storage interfaces. This is a history of DRAM interfaces. You can see that we have the normal progression of DDR and its predecessors. Each offers an uh, incremental improvement over earlier interface types. As the memory chip market has experienced a wide variety, wider variety of interfaces that become economically feasible, we list the compute-oriented ones here, including HBM, high bandwidth memory, and the Open Memory Interface, or OMI. HBM is a more costly interface where only the highest bandwidth will do. OMI takes a fresh look at what a memory interface should look like, leaving evolutionary changes behind it in favor of increased performance at an economical price. 
At the systems level, there have been a numerous interfaces over the years, but many are dying away in favor of interfaces based upon the PCIe physical interface, which Intel originally introduced in the early 1990s to support coprocessors. Most of the refinements in this diagram consist of new protocols layered above the PCIe physical interface. Once the issue of cache coherence was brought into the argument, a number of alternatives were spawned, but today those appear to be coalescing into two camps, CXL and OpenCAPI. Jim will now tell you about some interesting new approaches that are under development. Thanks, Tom. Another interesting solution to the data transfer challenge involves bringing processing elements into memory and storage devices. Let's have a look at some of those. Here's something that we showed you before. It's all the movement that happens in a typical system. The processor requests the data. The data is sent to the processor. Processor processes the data. And then data is moved back into storage. And then we'll show you another slide that we showed with it. Remember that the vertical axis represents performance. Compute and storage speed up over time, but the network doesn't keep pace. The next step then is to move some of the processing into the storage or memory. How does that work? So here's that same system that we just saw, but with some of the processing power moved into the storage. With this approach, the four steps in the earlier design boiled down to just two. The processor initiates a process by sending a very brief command to the computational storage device, and then the data is processed in place. There's no costly data movement, and so this saves time, money, energy, and cooling. Many chip makers have been considering this approach for years, and some of them have actually introduced a product. product. This kind of chip is often called compute in memory or processing in memory, PIM. We list a few of the more prominent examples here. Micron's Automata dates back more than a decade, as does Venray's Tommy. UpMem's PIM DPU is available on DIMMs and is shown in the photograph. All of these add relatively weak processors to a standard DRAM chip. GSI goes one step further and gives every single memory bit its own processing element. This is blazing fast for a narrow class of AI algorithms. Samsung has been making a lot of noise since last summer about the company's Aquabolt XL, which is very similar to a standard high bandwidth memory or HBM, like those that surround higher performance NVIDIA GPUs. The insert photo shows one of the hybrid DRAM compute dice within the Aquabolt XL. SK is working on a chip that they don't reveal very much about. But there are many, many other firms working on neural network chips that mimic the human brain. We'll explain how those work a few slides from now. The goal of all of these is to reduce data movement by adding processing elements to an inexpensive memory array. The story is similar for computational storage. Put some processing into an SSD, or at least bring it closer so that the data doesn't have to make the costly round trip to the server. All of the companies listed here do this, and probably some that we've left off. As was the case in the last slide, the goal is to reduce data move movement by adding processing elements to inexpensive storage devices. Some companies like Inspur, Cohesity, and IBM devote the computation to a single task, like data compression or video compression. Samsung's smart SSD uses a Xilinx FPGA and enables customizable processing, including encryption and decryption and virtual data optimization. While NGD and Scaleflux put a general purpose processor right inside the SSD, Ideticom puts the processor right beside the SSD or an SSD array, but not within the SSD itself. These companies through SNEA have done a lot of work to establish standards that will facilitate the adoption of this approach. This slide shows two of the four categories of computational storage that SNEA's Computational Storage Task Work Group, or TWIG, has defined. A computational storage drive, which is an SSD with a processor, and a similar drive that allows the host to either communicate with the processor or go directly to the data. This slide shows the other two device types, a computational storage processor that manages storage and other drives, and a computational storage array, 
which has a number of either SSDs or computational storage devices shown across the bottom, and the array control that may perform computation on its own. What benefits can be achieved through the use of computational storage? Scaleflux made a very good argument for the use of such devices at the Flash Memory Summit four years ago in 2018. This graph shows the throughput of a server performing a fuzzy search. The x-axis shows how many storage devices are tied to that server. The y-axis tells the throughput of the system. The red line running along the bottom shows how a certain server would perform when attached to a growing number of standard SSDs. The performance remains roughly the same, whether it's tied to one SSD or eight or 16 or 24. The system is either compute bound or IO bound. It doesn't accelerate as storage is added. If the SSDs in the system were replaced with computational storage drives, some of the computation could be offloaded to the SSDs. The black line shows the throughput scales linearly in proportion to the number of computational storage devices that are tied to the host server. Even with only a single computational storage device, throughput is three times as much as the server can do alone. This is simply because of the fact that the data doesn't have to travel back and forth to the host, along with the fact that there are now two processors doing a job that was previously being done only by the server. What's most important though, is that the performance increases in direct proportion to the number of computational storage devices that are tied to the host. If you want better throughput, simply add a few more computational storage devices. That's a compelling argument, but a lot of groundwork must be done before you can take this approach. And that's where standards organizations can help. As we add new types of hardware, the applications will need to change to take advantage of the new, all that the new hardware has to offer. How do you use this approach? The adoption of computational storage will be phased in by incremental steps. First, users will take the application programs they already know and love and split them into pieces, dedicating some tasks to the computational storage devices or in-memory processors and leaving the rest of the tasks on the host where they have always been. Once they get that working well, users will notice that their servers are idle for a lot of the time as they wait for the computational storage devices to finish processing their data. These users will naturally look for ways to share the tasks more intelligently so that they don't waste expensive server resources on idle cycles. The application programs will be lightly restructured and this will result in even higher performance. At some point, the users and applications developers will rethink the entire problem, taking dramatic new approaches that we aren't even thinking of today to bring computational storage into an entire new world, thanks to PIM and CSS. But the industry has to move in small steps to get there. Don't expect to see revolutionary change all at once. So far, we have only spoken about moving computation into memory and storage using mainstream von Neumann architectures. Many researchers are investigating approaches that can provide an extreme departure from the norm. Here's just a taste of those. The first is an approach that I don't believe even has a name yet. The idea is to take some of the ugliness of DRAM operation and to make it useful. DRAM bit cells are leaky capacitors that are read by bleeding their charge off to sense amplifiers, restoring it to a one or a zero and rewriting it back to the capacitor. The capacitors always try to find their way to an undefined state. So they must be kicked back to their assigned levels through a refresh cycle every so often. Meanwhile, adjacent cells leak into their neighbors, making it even more likely that a bit will be corrupted. University researchers are playing with this behavior and are working to provide a new form of computer logic that can actually put it to good use. A popular approach today is to use what they call majority not logic functions. In a DRAM, the bits are arranged in rows and columns. As I understand, a number of DRAM rows can be read at roughly the same time, stepping on each other's bits. If a certain bit location within the row contains a logic one for more rows than zeros, then the majority wins and that bit is read as a one and vice versa. This can be applied to certain AI algorithms. Naturally, all algorithms would have to be reconfigured to make the best use of this peculiar phenomenon and computer architectures would need to be completely restructured around this approach. But this work is being pursued in earnest at a number of reputable universities and research institutes. 
Another unusual approach is that of building neural networks out of chips that are configured like memory arrays. This is an idea that has been around for a long time. In fact, Intel developed a neural network chip in the 1980s. Neural networks, like almost all AI and ML, are designed to mimic the way that we believe the brain works. They use a lot of matrix algebra, multiplying inputs by weighting factors and summing the weighted values. The colorful upper graphic illustrates a matrix of those weights with the colors highlighting the values in the squares. Higher values are greener and lower values are more red. The lower graphic is an illustration of the inner workings of a neural network chip, which we'll explain in the following slide. Matrix algebra is the reason the GPUs have become popular in AI systems and why NVIDIA is able to ride the AI wave so well. NVIDIA processors are designed to excel at matrix algebra, so they're a good match to the problem. The attraction of the neural network chip is that it can perform matrix algebra even faster than a GPU and at a significantly lower cost, solving the entire matrix in a single cycle. It's a linear approach, so that single cycle is pretty slow. Still, one slow cycle is faster than tens or th of thousands or more fast cycles and consumes much less power. And that's the appeal of this approach. Today's systems are difficult to set up though. Training is usually performed on a supercomputer with recognition or inference performed at the neural net. Although this approach has a lot of advocates, research and devotees, the products are still not making it in, onto the market. Let's have a closer look at how neural networks really work. This slide gives us an idea of how a neural network operates. It's laid out like a memory chip with cells organized in rows and columns. Each of those cells appears here as an amber circle. In a memory chip, the rows or the blue horizontal lines are normally fed just one or zero to determine which row of bits will be output onto the columns or the red vertical lines. In a neural network though, different input voltages are in input to the rows. These are labeled V1, V2, and so forth down the left-hand side of this slide. Furthermore, each bit cell in a neural network just doesn't simply store a one or a zero, but it stores a linear weight, similar to the way that MLC flash stores multiple bits in each memory cell. Each input voltage is multiplied by the weight in the corresponding cell. The outputs of all cells on the same red vertical column are summed into a current representing the weights times the voltages. This same thing happens simultaneously in some of the, each of the other columns so that each column is the sum of the currents that result from multiplying the input voltages by that column's weights. It's a simple way to do matrix algebra and it's all done in a single very slow cycle. This means that 64,000 256 by 256 array performs a 64K multiplies and 64K sums all at the same time. In a conventional processor, each of these would be done in sequence with corresponding data loads and stores. You can see how even a slow linear system of this sort could outperform a fast digital system. By performing tasks within the memory bits themselves, there is almost no data movement and the memory wall is no longer an issue. Now, this isn't like anything that SNEA currently works with, but the values in the cells are stored. So a neural network is in fact a storage device. So should SNEA become involved? We'll leave that for others to decide. Now, Tom will discuss new technologies that can help with this. Thanks, Jim. Something nice about neural networks is they lend themselves to some emerging non-volatile memory technologies. And these new memories are beginning to take off. Today, there are four leading memory technologies, MRAM, resistive RAM, phase change memory, PCM, that are the basis of Intel's Optane memory and ferroelectric memory. Why are they interesting for processing in memory and neural networks? How can they help solve data movement problems to get past the memory wall? Well, all of these materials offer certain attributes. They're all non-volatile or persistent, so they provide faster boot, reduced power consumption, and better ref resilience from power outages. They're also poised to bring persistence closer to the processor, as we showed earlier in the presentation. Optane has brought persistence to near DRAM speeds. Today, MRAM and resistive RAM seem to be most likely candidates to be absorbed into processors, first as caches, and later as persistent registers. 
This will bring persistence right to the CPU's doorstep. But FRAM, Fair Electric RAM, shows a lot of promise and is, produ and is produced using materials that are already used in all high-performance processor chips. It might pose a challenge to MRAM and resistive RAM in this space. All of these technologies can be built on smaller chips than their established counterparts because their bit cells are smaller than today's technologies. And that implies that the new technologies can be produced at a lower cost than DRAM or perhaps even NAND flash. Most of them can be built into a cross-point array with 3D layers of cells uh, to further reduce chip size and cost. FRAM and ferroelectric RAM also lend themselves to the type of low-cost 3D manufacturing process that is used to make today's 3D NAND flash chips. They would provide persistence at a speed nearly the same as a DRAM at a price as low as NAND flash. Finally, all of these emerging memory technologies can store linear values so they can be used to store weights in neural networks. We know a lot about this because we've been studying this space for a number of years. If you'd like to avail yourself of this knowledge, we know of a very fine report that you could, that you could take a look at and perhaps you want to buy. Please tell your friends and work associates about it. But none of this will work together until the entire system supports it. And that's clearly the role of standards bodies in industry organizations like SNEA. SNEA has done good things for SSDs and persistent memory as these technologies were evolving not to mention what the association has achieved in its entire history. That same strength is now being applied to computational storage and other important initiatives. In the future, we anticipate similar work to bring the industry together to support persistent cache, persistent CPU registers, and processing in memory, or PIM, as it develops a role similar to some of today's CXL subsystems. SNEA may also take a role in standardizing neural networks since they store the weights used for inference. With that, we open the floor to questions. And please rate the session.